Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn some game theory. Today's topics are Hotelling's Game and the Median Voter Theorem. You can read more about these in Lesson 4.1 of Game Theory 101, The Complete Textbook. To give you a little bit of background here, if you've seen A Beautiful Mind, then you'll recall that John Nash did most of his major work in the 1950s. And while he was obviously central in generalizing this concept known as Nash Equilibrium today, he was not the first person to develop examples of Nash Equilibria. These examples actually predate him by quite a bit. And what we're going to be looking at in this lecture, Hotelling's Game, is an example that comes from Harold Hotelling all the way back in the 1920s. And his game looks like this. There are two vendors on a beach. They're selling an identical product at an identical price. Maybe these are ice cream cones for $2 a piece. The only thing that the vendors can differentiate on is where they're setting up their carts on this beach. Now, beach goers are lazy, and so they're going to buy from the closest cart. And if the two vendors locate themselves in the same place, then they'll just evenly split their business between these two vendors. So that's the setup for Hotelling's game. In a second, we're going to see how these vendors would locate themselves if their object or if their goal is to maximize their profits. But you'll recall here that the name of this lecture is Hotelling's Game and the Median Voter Theorem. I've given you Hotelling's Game here. You can see that this has absolutely nothing to do with voting, right? If you just look at this, there's nothing on this screen that would lead you to believe that this is actually a game about voting. And what I'm going to do first is I'm going to solve this game. But then afterward, I'm going to convince you that this game, the way you see it on your screen currently, is actually a game of voting as well. So let's first by start out. Let's first start out by solving this this hotelings game. We can do this by thinking of this beach as a unit interval between zero and one, and the beachgoers are just spread all the way around this str uh, the strand of beach, uh, this number line between zero and one. And for the sake of convenience, we're going to assume that those beachgoers are uniformly distributed. We could make some other assumptions about a different sort of interval other than, or a different sort of distribution other than a uniform distribution, but you would get similar concepts and it's not worth going into all that extra fancy math for no good reason. Now, when we're trying to solve for equilibria here between these two vendors, we have an obstacle, namely it's an infinite strategy space, right? This is the concern about lesson 4.1 is that some games have an infinite strategy space and so we can't just draw out a simple game matrix and solve this game. How on earth are we gonna do this? Well, if the problem is that both players have an infinite number of strategies, one possible solution, and this is only a possible solution, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, it will work here very well for us, is that if you are encountering a game with infinite an infinite number of strategies, then if you try proving what must be true about all equilibria, you might be able to greatly narrow the number of possibilities that you actually have to look for. If we're trying to narrow down equilibria and find all of a game's equilibria, if we know what an equilibrium has to look like, this will give us a huge step up in actually finding all of those equilibria. So what are we going to prove here? Well, I want you to take a look at vendor one locating himself at one half. You'll notice that if vendor one puts himself at one half, then he guarantees himself at least half of the business. Why is that? Well, imagine vendor two locates herself to the left of vendor one, then vendor one gets everything on the right and a portion of the business on the left. Now you'll notice here that I've actually placed vendor two at a specific location here. I need to do that to illustrate this visually, but this applies to anywhere if vendor two was here or here or here or here or here or here, anywhere to the left of vendor one, vendor, or yeah, anywhere to the left of vendor one, vendor one gets all of the business to the right and some portion of the business to the left. If vendor two were more over here, then vendor one would get more of it. If vendor two were somewhere over here, vendor one would get less of it. It doesn't matter. All we need to know here is that vendor one gets at least half if vendor two is on the left side. And in fact, if vendor two is on the right side, it's the same story. Now vendor one is getting everything on the left and a portion of everything to the right. Vendor one gets at least half in this case as well. And if vendor one and vendor two locate at the same position at one half, then vendor one gets half of the business, right? Because the beachgoers split themselves evenly between those two. Now, why do we care about this? Well, what we have shown here in these last three slides is that vendor one always has an option available to him, regardless of vendor two strategy, that guarantees vendor one at least half of the business. Now, remember, a Nash equilibrium is a mutual best response. So if vendor one is playing his optimal strategy, given what vendor two is doing, it must be the case that vendor one is getting at least half of the business. If he wasn't getting half of the business, then he would simply switch his strategy to playing one half and guarantee himself at least half of the business. So we've narrowed down something that must be true about any equilibrium. Any equilibrium must give vendor one at least half of the business.
but this is also true for vendor two, right? If we had done the same exact thing by putting vendor two in the middle, then we'd also see that vendor two can guarantee herself half of the business by placing herself at one half. So it must also be true that vendor two gets at least one half of the business in equilibrium. But it also has to be true that vendor one and vendor two collectively get a total of one, essentially 100% of the business in equilibrium. So if you see those three things, if you have those three properties, you can do a little bit of mathematical simplification here, and you'll see that vendor one has to be getting one half and vendor two has to be getting one half in equilibrium. This is only possible in two ways now, if vendor in one and vendor two have the same position on the beach or equidistant from the center of the beach. So what we've done here by illustrating or by by showing that something has to be true about equilibrium strategies, namely that vendor one has to be getting half of the business and vendor two has to be getting half of the business in equilibrium, then suddenly we can go from looking at all those infinitely many strategies to only two possible ways this can happen. So now we're just narrowing ourselves down to what happens when the vendors are equidistant or when they are at the same position. So let's start by looking at what happens when they're equidistant from the center. So we have vendor one on the left side and vendor two on the right side here. They're equidistant from the center. So everyone on the left half is going to vendor one and everyone on the right half is going to vendor two. Is this a Nash equilibrium? Well, no, it's not. And the reason for that is that vendor one can profitably deviate to moving toward the center. Same with vendor two, but we only need to show one profitable deviation to prove that this wasn't an equilibrium. And vendor one does have this profitable deviation to move to one half, because if he moves to one half, he goes from getting half of the business before to getting more than half of the business, right? He's getting everything on the left and now a portion of what's on the right. And this covers every single way that these guys can be equidistant, right? So they could be, vendor one could be over here all the way at zero and vendor two could be all the way over at one, or we could get closer and closer and closer and closer. It doesn't matter what we've done by just looking at this. We have seen every single case where they're equidistant from the center. And we see that vendor one has a profitable deviation by moving to the center. So that's the profitable deviation. It can't be the case that they're placing themselves equidistant from the center in equilibrium. Well, the only other way that you can get both of them to get one half in equilibrium is if they play the same location. So imagine they play the same location anywhere to the right of one half. Well, if they're doing that, guess what? Vendor one can profitably deviate. Where can he profitably deviate to? Well, he's getting half the business here, but if he were to move himself back to one half, one half again is our friend, then he gets more than half the business. Now he's getting everyone to the left and a portion of what's uh, what the business is to the right. And so player one or vendor one has a profitable deviation. It can't be the case that vendor one and vendor two are both locating themselves to the right in equilibrium. But of course, this is also true if we look at both of them to the left, right? If both of them are to the left of one half, again, they're both getting half the business, but now vendor two or vendor one, either one, could switch to moving to one half and guarantee him or herself more than half the business. So it can't be the case that they're both playing the same location to the left of one half or both playing the same case or both playing the same place to the right of one half, that leaves just a single possibility left for equilibrium. And again, this is an infinite game, so maybe there aren't any equilibria, but there's just one case that we haven't covered yet, and that's if they both locate themselves to one half. And if they both do this, you'll see that this is actually an Ash equilibrium because everyone here is getting one half, right? So vendor one, vendor two, both getting half of the business. If either one of them moves to anywhere else other than one half, they would get less than one half of the business. So they do not have any profitable deviations. And if they do not have any profitable deviations, this is a Nash equilibrium. So the unique Nash equilibrium of the hotelings game is to have both of the vendors situate themselves at exactly one half. So they're getting half of the business each. They're locating themselves at exactly where half of the business is spatially and forcing everyone on the sides, everyone at zero and everyone at one to go toward the center because that's what's best for those two vendors. It's the only thing that is stable and equilibrium for those two vendors. Now, I said that this is actually the same thing as what happens in politics in, time, in terms of voting. And why is that the case? Well, instead of thinking about this as a beach that goes from zero to one, you can think of this as politics. So this is a, a single dimension of ideology. So we have a liberal side, a liberal wing on the left and a conservative wing to the right. And something very interesting happens whenever you get into the presidential election. You have liberals who have, or you have Democrats who traditionally are supposed to have a liberal platform, and you have conservatives who are 
tr- Republicans who are traditionally conservative and are supposed to have a conservative platform, and yet they do the exact same thing every time you go into the general election. They both move exactly toward the center. They're like, oh yeah, I'm the centrist. You should vote for me. And the reason that they do this is for the exact same reason as the logic of Hotelling's game. To win the election, these guys both need to get half of the votes, right? If I'm a Democrat and I want to win the election, I need to get half of the votes. If I'm a Republican and I want to win the election, I need to get half the votes. If I situate myself anywhere other than halfway, other than that median point, then the other guy can situate himself at that median point and guarantee himself a victory in the election. And so the reason that you see these guys pushing themselves toward the center is because they want to capture that median voter, that halfway guy. And so that's why we call this the median voter theorem. And that's why you see Republicans and Democrats alike during the general elections pushing themselves and claiming to be the centrists of the election. It's to capture that median voter, capture at least half of the vote, and guarantee themselves at least a draw in the general election if they get exactly half of the votes. So that's Hotelling's game, and it's also the median voter theorem. I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope to see you next time when we talk about second price auctions. Take care.